from the Julia Morgan Ballroom in San Francisco. Extracting the signal from the noise, it's the Cube. Covering Structure 2015. Now your host, George Gilbert. And we're back. This is George Gilbert. We're live at the Julia Morgan uh, Ballroom in downtown San Francisco at the iconic Structure 2015 conference. Uh, we have a very special guest with us, Jerry Chen. Um, formerly, uh, uh, I guess we could say, leading a big chunk of VMware and now <laughs> having moved to Greylock. Jerry, good to have you with us. Thanks for having me. So, um, give us some context. When, when you moved over to, to Greylock, um, what did the industry look like to you? What were the opportunities you were looking for sure. then? You know, I joined Greylock um, back in 2013, so almost three years ago. And you know, I saw there a bunch of different waves happening in technology from, you saw the big data wave, you saw the cloud wave. And one of the waves that I was focused on is something I call DDI, Developer Defined Infrastructure. And what we saw at my decade of VMware was a shift towards developers as making decisions around infrastructure. Amazon as a cloud is a perfect example of developers making what used to be IT decisions. And so that led to a bunch of investments or a bunch of um, investigations by me in technologies like Docker, which I invested in two years ago, um, other data plays that I also have been spending time in, or security plays I've been spending time in, really looking at how uh, developers and data scientists really are rethinking what traditional IT was. Would that be, um, would it be fair to say that this was the capture the developer as the design win, and then you know you have to reach IT who pays for sort of uptime? I think it's, it's fairly correct. I mean, I think all these technologies now, there are two halves to a product. There's going to be a developer or a data scientist or a user aspect to it. And that user is going to be a developer for technologies like Docker or a database, a data scientist for either a database or an analytics platform, or an end user for like next generation enterprise apps, be it a, like a mobile client. And, but on the back side, there's going to be an IT buyer, security, manageability, scalability, reporting, auditing. And so when you go to market, you have to think about what does the IT buyer want, all those illities, but also what do the users want? And that user population used to be either strictly IT or strictly end user, but now the number of populations you sell to in a company have changed, right? Developers, data scientists, business analysts, um, mobile sales forces, construction workers, you know, the, the population of users for technology has just exploded. Okay, so let's, let's take a look at that. Now, we have what seems to be a slow motion price collapse in infrastructure software because mm -hmm. of open source mm -hmm. and because of cloud meter yep. priding, pricing. Um, you have to reach different constituencies, so that would suggest perhaps a higher cost sell unless it's more self-service. How yeah. do you square that circle? You know, it's, um, it's not necessarily higher cost, but the, where you spend the dollars are different. So for example, open source is a, is a great example. Look at uh, Docker or Hadoop and Cloudera, two examples of using open source as a way to reach potential customers that reduces the friction for selling, reduces the marketing cost. There's a selling cost of trying to sell the enterprise product behind the developer or the data scientist adoption, but those dollars are shifted, right? So whereas you used to have I know, a large marketing campaign to try out my new database or a new language, d the open source has become a great way for developers to you know, vote with their feet. So they like the technology, they like the framework, they'll use it, and um, that's more or less not free. You have to still invest and spend money into a developer ecosystem, but the type of dollars change. Do the, um, do the economics work where, in, in the old day, to get that initial sale, yeah. you needed the license, sure. you know, and that yeah. essentially was a lost leader. Now, um, is that initial sort of land, yeah. you know, of land and expand, is that self-service enough so that we don't need the upfront license? You know, it's, it's a great question. Um, I, I think there's there's two things we're trying to unpack. One's a, a, a shift from a perpetual license to subscription, right. as well as kind of the cash flow issues of getting paid up front versus not getting paid up front for open source. Right. So I think the accounting, we, we're, we're, what, 10 years into the SaaS business model now, I think we've learned that. Look, if you can get the customer, 
acquire the, the entity, the subscription model is actually great because it gets predictable revenues, predictable cash flows. You don't have to worry about renewals or lumpy enterprise sales. I think the question then becomes, how can you cost effectively land that customer? Right. And that's a combination of using new techniques like um, you know, open source, um, app stores for the consumerization of IT, like uh, Apple App Store, the Google Play Store, uh, through the web. So there are things you can do to reduce your cost of land, but it's not for every product. There's some products that are, that are like large systems, like enterprise applications, that still have a large land because they're selling to the entire company. So it's hard to be but absolute. Those, they, those have not gone through sort of the price collapse, the applications. That's one. correct, that's correct. Because in infrastructure space, you're, 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 like you said, you're stuck between open source and a cloud space, right? right. OSS on one side, and, and Amazon, Google, um, Azure on the other side. And so threading that needle of how to you know, use open source as, um, as momentum uh, uh, driver, but then sell enterprise products around or behind it is a kind of a, a new business model that a lot of the companies around here are pioneering. I think a couple companies involved with like Docker and Cloudera are kind of proving that it's possible to build a business in this, this world. So let me um, go back on this, on this yeah. topic and drill down a little bit. Um, a lot of the infrastructure companies I talk to say, we're, we're going to make money by helping the customer operate our software. Okay. Um, in other words, they understand they're not going to make it in the initial sort of, uh, selling to the developer, yeah. the design win. But if you look at a matrix of sort of application software, middleware, infrastructure, and a couple other layers, and then there's performance management, change management, yeah. high availability. Yeah. Basically, when they say we're helping the developer run the software, yeah. they're talking about like giving them a console in that one box in performance management. I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit. No, I think, I think it, it, it's hard to um, say that's for all products, right? So I think from installation, optimizing, running, monitoring, upgrading, tuning, that whole life cycle, um, upgrading, is part of running it, right? And, and you can either do that as a, as a software subscription, you can run as a service in the cloud, but I think that life cycle are, are all things enterprise will pay for. Yes. Um, and if it's in the cloud, for sure you can capture sure. that, because you also get the integration points. You're, the vendor's responsible for the integration points. But if it's on premise, yeah. let's say it's you know, your uh, um, a messaging product or um, some part that fits into a bigger stack, yeah. every one of those products has their own um, failure model, their own sure. high availability model, their own you know, fault tolerance, security model. How do you get those to play together, even if each vendor gives you yeah. a life cycle? That's been, um, that's, that's, everything old is new again, right? So I think we, the pendulum swings with these integrated systems where people try to sell storage, compute, networking, a big box, all the sun, and then it broke apart into like storage as a separate category, network as a separate category, storage as a separate category, and then how do you make those things run together, support the things together as well? Yeah. And just like in the physical world, you had this pendulum swing from, integrated to piecemeal, and there were viable business models in best of breed. In software, you also have folks who want to g offer the whole suite versus best of breed software products. And just like in the physical world where you had best of breed infrastructure, physical infrastructure, best of breed software infrastructure can also play well together. Okay, so then it's a question of perhaps the class of customer, like the early adopter can, sure. can s sort of swallow the multi-vendor components. So, all right, I took you on a digression to uh, you know, sort of operating expenses. Perhaps tell us what you see as some of the more um, promising, uh, well, let's just make it open-ended categories yeah. where, you know, maybe not the next Uber, but the, you know, what do enterprises have to do to move to, you know, beyond just the ERP replacement, sure. that sort of thing? Well, I think um, ERP is a great category where you have large horizontal apps like HR, CRM, 
financials, but I think different verticals also lend themselves to disruption as well. I just invested in a company called Rumbix in the construction software space. So construction is a $10 trillion vertical that historically hasn't spent a lot of money on technology, but now they're using GPS to like track their tractors and cranes, using drones to measure progress, and Rumbix is using smartphones and mobile technology to make your workforce more productive and safer. And so you think about there's a bunch of horizontal applications like ERP you mentioned, but I get really excited by different vertical applications like construction, like healthcare, like financials, that have um, plenty of opportunity for this kind of end-to-end -end applications that are, that are very disruptive and actually can make a big difference in, in both the top line and bottom line for a said business. And I imagine on those, um, again, part of, the, part of the value, since it's being run by the vendor, yeah. the, the problem with on-premise was every customer had to write the integration points, and here the vendor can do it just to the uh, common yeah. the common applications that their well, customers run. I, both on-premise, off-premise, but I also think um, in this cloud world and the way apps are being built today, uh, everything has an API, everything has kind of a, a underlying plumbing, so the way to integrate applications is a lot easier today, and I think you're seeing a bunch of companies now come together to either build a full stack app, but can also integrate with like classic databases, ERP applications, um, security applications. So I really think we're oh, at this so integratable by design. By design, it's, it's, it's kind of like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, if you had a business, you had to make sure you had a website. Now if you write an application, you better make sure you have an API, right? Because okay. you, almost every app now is going to have a way to integrate and talk to other apps by design. Okay, all right, Jerry Chen, we're going to have to leave it there. No worries. It's always great to hear your insights. And this is George Gilbert. Uh, we'll be back in a few moments. This is um, Structure 2015, downtown San Francisco. Thanks. <laughs>